Ghosts of Harren Hall, my name's Simon. And I'm McKelly. Thank you for joining us for episode 154 of our chapter by chapter book review of A Song of Ice and Fire by George Martin. Today we'll be discussing chapter 10 of A Storm of Swords, that's Davos 2. And as always, we're going to chat about the chapter, we're going to try not to spoil any future plot points for you, and hopefully we're going to provide you some entertainment along the way. We'll summarise what happened, discuss our thoughts on it, provide some useful background, compare it to the television show, indulge in a little pedantry, and cover some relevant news and listener correspondence. Be sure to check out the show notes, they'll provide some additional information about the characters and other things of notes in this chapter. How are you, McKelly? I'm doing fine. It's good to see your face. I um, You were missing this morning. <laughs> yes, we were supposed to record this morning and I, I had a lie in, which was very strange. I never set an alarm because I have two dogs that are an alarm clock, but Penny's a little under the weather and she let me sleep in. So I missed it. I do apologize. It happens. I'm glad you got to sleep in. I know you don't get to do that often. So Yeah, almost never. It's weird. So um, I also, I played uh, soccer today uh, oh. for my new team. I have I have moved up a division Uh-oh. at soccer. Mm. You might have misunderstood what I meant by that. I've become, I've moved into an older. Yes, yeah, so I bracket. thought that might have been what you meant. <laughs> and I've discovered, I've discovered, I can't tell my teammates apart because I don't wear my glasses when I'm playing soccer, so everything's just a little bit blurry, and they're all just slightly pudgy, grey-haired people. <laughs> <So> <laughs> they all blend into one. I'm like, I don't know who you are. <laughs> no, they're interchangeable parts at this point. <laughs> the the other thing that happened was I, I was subbed out for a while because we had we had five subs so we were all taking turns being sub and I was sitting on the end of the bench and the coach said all right you two get up and the two guys on the bench with me got up and the bench sort of lifted up because I was sitting on the end of it. <laughs> and he was like and he was like you need to get in there. <laughs> Oh, that's unfortunate timing right there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, well. Did you guys win at least? No, we lost. I uh, I went onto the field and we were 2-1 up. Oh, no. About, <laughs> ten, about 10 minutes later, we were 5-2 down. I was like, <laughs> oh, man. Was this your debut? This is my debut for them. I have played a couple of times as a guest player, but now I'm fully in that team. It was my first time as a full-time player. Well, Not the best. There's only one way to go from there, it sounds like. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> it's, a, it's a shame, actually, because it was kind of, in many ways, it was the season decider because it's the best, the, we're the two best teams. Okay. And we, we, we met in just the second game of the season and uh, we blew it. Uh, yeah, well. <sighs> You'll get them next time, Tiger. We will. We I think we play them twice, so we do have another. We have a chance at revenge. All right, good. Eh, not much going on with me. I uh, I was out on the lake today. You know, I was thinking about it because I was I was thinking, did anything interesting happen to me this week? Not not that I want to talk about on uh, a public forum <laughs> like this anyway. <laughs> and um, I was like, oh no, it just came from the lake. And I was like, you know, I feel like we misrepresent ourselves. It's like boat. You know, uh, boat <laughs> people, neither of us even own a boat. We just happen to know people who own boats and, and sometimes and, get invited out on those boats. <laughs> and let me tell you, uh, careful listener, that's the way to do it. It is. Those people have a lot of responsibilities with that whole boat thing. Oh, no kidding. I watch them work on that and I'm like, I would never do this. If I got a boat, I would never use it because of the whole rigmarole of getting it <laughs> right. in the water. You'd think about all the steps ahead of time and be like, nah, <laughs> next weekend. <laughs> but yeah, God bless them. It's great to have friends with boats. It sure is. It's the best way to have a boat, really. All right, well, let's get down to business. How did we leave Davos? Uh, last we saw of Davos Seaworth, I've just had a mental fart there. Is his last name Seaworth? Mm-hmm. Yes, it yes. just didn't seem right. <laughs> um, while we're editing something out, um, I was on a call with someone yesterday who said the word, I'm going to spell it and you have to think about it, I-N-W-A-R-D. Inward, okay. And I heard N hyphen W O R D. Do we have to edit that out? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, what did 
Just, oh, 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 inward. Oh, it's the like inward. internal. Right, right, right. <laughs> and that it reminded me of there's a running joke in Arrested Development. Have you ever seen Arrested Development? I have, yep. The, the, their boat is called the S E A W A R D, the C word. <laughs> There's a running joke. <laughs> They're saying C hyphen word. Right. You know. uh, Good stuff. Yes. So last we saw of Davos Seaworth, he was washed up on a tiny island in the middle of Blackwater Bay, having miraculously avoided the wildfire conflagration that certainly claimed four of his sons. He had no idea how the battle had ended, but when a ship pulls up, he announces for King Stannis and is taken aboard as a friend. McKelly, why don't we give the summary of this one? A sick and weak Davos stands on deck aboard Shayala's dance as Dragonstone comes into view in the distance. His thoughts are consumed by the red woman Melisandre. He thinks Melisandre has broken Stannis to her will and now plans to ride him to power, his son's lives being the cost of her ambition. For that, he plans to cut out her heart and burn it as she burned his son's. His reputation as the Onion Knight has allowed him a certain level of celebrity on the ship, to the point where Captain Corain Sathmantes has given Davos his own cabin to use. The captain filled Davos in on some events that have taken place while Davos was marooned. He learned about Stan- Stannis' bannermen leaving him during the fight to join the Lannister Tyrell cause, led by Ranley Baratheon's shade. That the Lysene ships took as many of Stannis' men as they could off land, including many from House Florent, and that Lord Alistair Florent is now Stannis' Hand of the King. As they dock in the Dragonstone Harbour, Davis notices how empty it is, filled primarily with the striped Lysene ships of his buddy Salador San. It's San that the captain plans to take him to first. Davis only has designs on seeing the king and a certain red woman, but the captain insists, and Davis is too weak and sick to argue. They find San taking inventory in the hold of a Pentashi cog. The Lysini pirate can hardly believe his eyes at the sight of Davos. After a bear hug, San, or Sala, as Davos calls him, has Davos escorted to the captain's cabin for food and hot wine to help with Davos's unsettling cough. When San joins Davos, he explains he's acquired the ship because he's now the Lord of Blackwater Bay by decree of Alistair Florent, Hand of the King. Any ships on the water without San's leave are smugglers. San confirms that Davos' son, Dale and Allard, did not return from the river. However, his son Devon did make it off land, safe and sound, having never left King Stannis' side. Davos is dizzy with relief. San offers Davos a ship to visit his wife and other young sons on Cape Wrath, provided Davos return to his smuggling ways and work for him. Davos thanks him for his kindness, but says his place is with the king. San tells Davos the king has changed since the battle. He sees no one but Melisandre. His court is kept by Queen Selyse and her uncle Alistair the Hand. The pair use the king's seal to make whatever decisions they see fit into rulings without consulting the king. Meanwhile, the king and Melisandre spend their days deep in the volcano, watching the flames. Davos tells San... It's Melisandre's fault the fire consumed them on the Blackwater, as punishment for Stannis sending her back to Dragonstone, a lesson for Stannis that he can't win without her and her powers. San says Davos isn't the first to say such things, but he shouldn't be saying them loudly. The Queen's men have sharp ears and sharper knives. Davos has a knife too, and he plans to use it on Melisandre, if she can be killed. Salador begs Davos to rest and recuperate here with him. His talk is dangerous. While the men were burning on the black water, the queen was burning traitors. But Davos won't be deterred. He's sent by the mother. It was her that blew Shayala's dance so close to the spears of the Merlin king to rescue him. The two part ways acrimoniously. Davos makes his way to the castle, where he's asked to wait in a garden. While waiting, he runs into Princess Shireen and the fool Patchface, and literally runs into another boy that accompanies the pair. The boy has the eyes, hair, and face of a Baratheon, but with the ears of a Florent. Davos recognizes him as at once as Edric Storm, the nephew of King Stannis and bastard son of King Robert. The boy worries over Davos's cough, and when he learns who Davos is, asks to see his shortened fingers. Upon inspection, the boy determines the job ill done. Davos saved Stannis and his people with his smuggling. He shouldn't have been punished for his past deeds. His father wouldn't have punished him in such a way. 
At that moment, Axel Florent arrives with a dozen other Queen's men. Davos asks if he's taking him to the king. Axel says on the contrary, he's taking Davos to the dungeon. He commands the men take Davos's knife. He planned to kill their lady with it. Right, well. I like this chapter. I thought it moved things along a little bit. I mean, I, I was worried that Davos was going to sort of spend a lot of time recuperating, but, you know, he, he threw himself back into this pretty quickly. He did, much to Salador San's dismay. Right, yeah. Also, I, I, I like the sort of evolution of the of the whole Florence taking some control over Team Stannis. I think that's an interesting development. Sure. While Stannis becomes more withdrawn and more focused on what Melisandre is seeing. I do think my over my overarching feeling about the chapter is though a sort of simmering injustice against Melisandre. The poor <laughs> woman was sidelined. She can't be the one to blame. Yeah. It's not her fault. He's definitely become um a bit obsessed. He's literally he everything he sees reminds him of Melisandre. Um he sees a fire atop a tower at sharp at sharp point and it reminds him of the ruby at her throat he sees the red clouds at dawn and at sunset and it reminds him of the red gowns that she wears and uh he's yeah he's he's absolutely convinced she's to blame for all their bad fortune right right but she definitely helped them i mean possibly by dabbling in magic she should not have dabbled in but she definitely helped them get to the point where they had a chance that's I mean, a, yeah, sure. My God, without without her, they'd still be camping in front of Storm's End for another couple of years, you know. <laughs> yes. <laughs> or Renly's army would have uh, run them over <laughs> the True. next that very morning before uh, when he was killed. The other, just just a quick aside. The other thing I notice is the name of the ship, Shayala's Dance. It's kind of like a uh, a portmanteau, if you will, of the names of. Uh, like bring, bring in, pushing two words together. Okay, yeah. yeah. Um, Fancy word right there. Of Tyrion's uh, lover and also of the woman who was uh, used as a decoy to protect her lo- his lover. Shayala. Oh, Shayala. Oh, yeah, yeah. yes. Yeah. I not, had not uh, thought of that. I mean, it seems, it's probably just completely random, but I, I went, when I read it, I thought, oh, that's kind of like their two names. Shay and Alayaya, right? Right, so yeah. Two, Maybe Tyrion would have named a ship as such. R- right. <laughs> <laughs> Although Shay comes across to me as someone who wouldn't want her name munged with another woman's. Oh, even if she, yeah. Even if she owed a debt to that other woman. That's, that's a, yeah, I could see that. I could see that. Tyrion's biggest ship could be Shay, and he could have like a little dinghy called Alayaya. <laughs> <laughs> he owes her that much, at least. Exactly. Yeah. But yeah, so like you're saying, um, yeah, Davos, he is completely focused on Melisandre as being the the force behind all this stuff. He thinks, as we mentioned, the summary that. She, being Melisandre, broke him, being Stannis, as a man breaks a horse and now plans on riding him to power. And for that, uh, my he, she gave my sons to the fire. It just constantly, everything that's talked about turns to, this is Melisandre's fault. Yeah, but it, it he does hark back to his sort of like his come to the mother moment on the Merlin king's uh, spears where he feels like she spoke to him and said the reason you failed is because uh yes melisande destroyed my you know destroyed our, our religion yeah exactly so so i think it's I, I do think he he's had sort of this road to damascus moment where he's begun to think she's she's evil she's fighting our gods and our gods have paid us back and so we need to get rid of her. Yes. And that kind of thinking doesn't always need evidence to back it up. Right. I agree. I agree. And so another thing that I like the way you said his name, Cohorain Sathmantes. You said it very you had a quite a nice little flair on it. I, I don't listen to the I don't listen to the book, <laughs> so I have to sort of I liked your version of it. Uh he mentions tells him uh Davos about how the battle ended on the Battle of the Blackwater and that Stannis and many of the Florent men were taken off land onto the ships, including Davos' son Devon. 
and that a lot of uh, Stannis's newly acquired bannermen that came over to him from Renly turned uh, to re- turned on Stannis when they saw Renly's ghost. Now we knew about we've heard about this before in other chapters about this Renly's ghost concept. It's we've heard it over a span of many chapters, and we've seen no evidence that Renly is still living. So it it seems pretty obvious that it's some kind of trick that the Tyrells and Lannisters played. It doesn't require a great deal of, uh, you know, setup. Basically, someone who fits into Renly's armor and can <laughs> yes. wield a sword and ride a horse. You get those components, you got yourself Renly's shade. Uh, <laughs> because, I mean, first of all, you know, uh, Kohorain could could be wrong, but... He says that he fought, that this Renly Shade led the Lannister vanguard. Now, we know Loras Tyrell led the Tyrell vanguard. So why would Renly be fighting alongside the Lannisters? And where has he gone? Right, <laughs> right. Yes. Yeah, it, it does feel like they pulled a, a subterfuge. But, I mean, it was quite clever. Because oh, yeah. Renly's, Renly's death was always shrouded in sort of like mystery and sort of like... There was a sort of, I mean, we know it was Melisande's magic that caused it. But to those who didn't witness it, there was this sense that there was something magical occurred. And then, so for his ghost to come back, well, that kind of fits with the narrative, you know. And so you could definitely turn some people who were, well, we'll move over to Stannis' side, but that's only because our lord was killed, you know. As soon as they see him again, well... That could flick the switch back. So it was a smart move by the Lannisters. But yeah, I gotta say, your interpretation is exactly my interpretation. Stick a big guy in this armor and pretend he's Renly. Yes, right. It seems it seems pretty clear at this point there's something like that going on. It seems it wasn't Loras, because Loras is said to have been leading a different vanguard and not dressed as Renly Baratheon. So we'll have to see who it might have been. Or... Maybe it was, uh, maybe they just channeled his ghost for that one battle. <laughs> Good point. Definitely possible. I mean, oh, they brought an other down, you know, for one special. <laughs> so, um, one thing I will say, actually, is I get my, my, my vision of, uh, Loras and Renly is somewhat influenced by the TV show. And I see that, as, I, as we've been reading the book, I always thought that Loras was a candidate for the one wearing it. Because obviously, you don't want this person to get killed very easily so he needed to have some skills right so loris was a good candidate in that respect because he's about as good a swordsman as you could have but i think the book makes it clear that loris is actually kind of like loris is fairly well represented in the tv show as a sort of willowy thin fella whereas renly was shown in the tv show as about the same size as loris but he's a baratheon and they're big dudes. They are right. big and strong, the Baratheons. So it, they, he wouldn't have been a physical fit in sure. uh, in this respect. And as you say, we actually know he was fighting in a different place. So it makes no sense. But then again, it makes no sense that Renly's ghost fought. So, <laughs> so who knows? <laughs> we'll have to wait and see if this is revealed in due time. I, I, it must be at this point because it's been mentioned so many times. It feels right. like it would be like sort of like leaving us in the dark if you never tell us how the heck that happened. You know? Right. Like who tried to kill Bran? Who paid the cat's paw to try and kill mm-hmm. Bran? We better find out who that is at some point. Right. <laughs> so San, when Davos goes to meet Salador, San, uh, at first, Salador doesn't even believe he's seeing his friend Davos, and then he accepts that it really is Davos. And he tells him that Dale and Allard, unfortunately, did not survive. There was two other sons that also died but in the fire, but the, they weren't mentioned. And that um, Devin did survive. And, and then he tells him, yeah, I will give you a ship to go visit your wife and your other two young sons, Stannis and Stefan. But, you know, and, and the other good part is, hey, you and I can go into business together again and you can uh, do some smuggling for me. And, uh, you know, Davos turns it down. But um, it beca- basically because he's obsessed with this concept that he has to kill Melisandre. He says it's right. I, my, my duty is to my king, but really his 
focus is just all about. He doesn't even expect to survive, I don't think, killing Melisandre. Yeah, and, and the offer is not just a sort of return to his smuggling days, because because Salador San has been sort of like made, you know, the what was he, Lord of Blackwater? And so he now patrols the seas, and anyone who's not paying tribute to uh, to Stannis is considered a smuggler. And basically... It's sort of legalized pirating. Yes, you know? yes, it basically... is. <laughs> and so, so it's it's actually right up both of their alleys. They both really enjoy it, you know. But you're absolutely right. He's uh, he's not interested. And to a certain extent, I mean, I think ninety nine percent of this is the fact that he's become obsessed with this idea of getting revenge. But I think one percent of it is he's become a trusted advisor to the king. Right. He doesn't want to go back to his old life. Sure. You know? Even, yes. Yeah. Absolutely. I agree. But it seems like San is is trying to give him an alternative path. Now, of course, he, he's also looking at, at his own benefit. He knows that, that Davos was a successful smuggler and would love him back on board. But I also think he's trying to redirect him oh, yeah. to another yeah, path sure. here. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, theoretically, he probably, no one else knows he survived at this point. You know, like he could, if he wanted to take him up on this offer, probably no one would ever find out that he survived. And Stannis has got a lot bigger fish to fry. So, you know, it would be a long time before Stannis might be in position to to retaliate to Davos for, uh, you know, being alive and not coming back to him. We'll be right back. Hello, friends. Are you ready to make some unforgettable memories? Well, if so, consider the Marriott Bonvoy program. Discover the perfect destination for your summer getaway and unlock exclusive deals on luxurious accommodations. With our affiliate partnership, you'll enjoy unbeatable savings and a seamless booking experience. Don't let summer slip away. Visit Marriott Bonvoy today and make this vacation season one for the books. Use our Ghosts of Heron Hall affiliate page to check it all out and buy Bonvoy points or give some as a gift. The link to our page is in the show notes. That being said, certainly at the time when he had this offer on the table and could think about that, you're right. There would be an expectation. If you were given a ship and you went off to Kate Rath and you saw your family, Stannis might never discover that you were alive. However, later on in the chapter, we do learn that the Florence have ears everywhere, and so news of his survival is going to reach them for sure. Yes, that's so, true. That seems possible. So, why? I mean, Salador explains what he's doing. You know, this sort of legalized uh, piracy. It is kind of again. We often hear about Stannis being incorruptible and very moral, but this is somewhat immoral. I mean, basically, it's piracy. But yep. then again, at the same time, if you consider yourself the king, then you are owed the taxes of these trade fleets. And uh, But I mean, he's, again, he's showing more moral flexibility than it was ever suggested he had. If he knows, because it was Alistair Florent, Hand of the King, that right, signed the parchment. Right, so right. Uh, Stannis might not even know that this agreement has happened. Now, you can understand why they, why Stannis's council would need to figure out some way to pay Salador San because they, he's, his fleet is the only fleet they have left, basically. So they need to keep him around just so they have some way of getting off of the island if they need to. <laughs> yeah, true enough. And also, I think, I think there's also the potential for this to expand your fleet. I mean, if you impound these ships oh, and you bring yeah. them in, then you've got more more ships. Um, yeah, yeah. And th- this whole plan here will work fine right now because the Royal Fleet was destroyed as badly as Stannis's fleet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But when the Red Wine Fleet comes up around, you know, around the southern end of uh, Westeros, that's going to be a different story. Yeah. Um. So... The one thing we didn't mention in the in the recap is that the ship that they're on uh, belonged to Illyrio Mopatis. They mention it because the chair that um, I think Salador is sitting in. They, I think they both. I, Davos sits in a chair when he first gets there and thinks I could three of me could fit in this chair comfortably. Right. And then and Davos, was... I mean uh, Salador, comes in and says uh, the the chairs were fit to Illyrio Mopatis's size. 
Right. So he calls right. him a whale with whiskers. Right. <laughs> but, yeah, you know, uh, speaking of, of this being Illyrio's ship, he's gotten a good deal poorer in the last few chapters. He's lost this ship here, Bountiful Harvest, on the heels of the three ships he sent to Danny and everything they contain. Now, <laughs> it's assuming... We we assume he probably will get those three ships back if Danny goes by land, like um, Jorah proposes. But the goods inside the ship, those are a different matter. <laughs> well, the goods inside the ships have been converted, or will be converted into an army of Unsullied. Illyrio could say, is that my army? <laughs> right. I feel like I paid for it. <laughs> I feel like I paid for that army. <laughs> Although this whole thing does prove Jorah's point that the trip the trip back to Pentos is dangerous whether you go by land or sea. They could end up uh, being caught by someone else or by one of Salador's people. But it, it does feel like he's basically patro- patrolling the waters leading into back yeah. to King's Landing. Yeah, just so, in the Blackwater. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just Which in is, the bay. I mean, anyway. strategically, that's a good idea because obviously you could sort of gain intel on sort of comings and goings and also perhaps, you know help to harry and prevent too much reinforcement reaching king's landing by water although is there any real prospect here of stannis getting back to king's landing it feels like not anytime soon yeah. right yeah so if eventually like you said once the red wines arrive this becomes a losing proposition for salador but i think salador is nimble enough to get himself out of there rather than you yeah. know, fight to the death i would think so i would think so and you know like you were saying about Stannis uh, earlier regarding the uh, the morality of this whole le- uh, legalized pirating. So Davis, uh, Davis is told of how Stannis' men deserted him when the Lannister Tyrell forced attack. We just mentioned that a few minutes ago. And, you know, Stannis gets grief for this rigid, unforgiving nature of his. And we gave him credit for seeing the need to forgive the lords who backed Renly and then came to him when Renly died. But it turns out he would have been better off if he either just told him to, you know, send them packing or, you know, lop their heads off or something because he didn't get a whole lot out of that army in the first place. They they pretty much bailed on him as the first sign of Renly's armor. It's very it's very true. I, it's, it's a good interview question. If uh, your former lord were to come back to life, would you <laughs> right. go back to work for him? <laughs> right. <laughs> He did not ask that question clearly. Uh, yeah. But yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, it's... it's, and, and I wonder if that might make him more rigid again in the future. Like, Oh, yes. Know, He's burned. See, yeah. yeah. See what it costs me to do that? Yeah. Good point. So, uh, Saladon knows that Devon is alive. He was one of the people that got uh, rescued because he stayed by Stannis' side. So that would have... Uh, he would have noticed... Um, You'd like to think that this would dissuade, dissuade Sta- uh, Davos from his murderous path against Melisande, but it most certainly does not. No, and Sala, Salador son, brings up the fact that he's just adding to the grief of his wife and remaining right. children by getting himself killed here. Yeah, because as he said, whether you succeed or fail, the outcome is you're going to get killed. You know, right. No two ways about it. Yeah. Um, but Stannis... Is sort of got this enforced absence going on, which has allowed uh, his wife, Queen Solis, and her uncle, Alistair Florent, to basically take over. And this is this is troubling. I mean, this is troubling when you're when your reign is crumbling. To allow a powerful house to sort of take the reins is probably ill advised. Yes, right. It, for for a man on the brink, it seems like a bad idea. And, you know, yeah. he just doesn't seem like the type of guy who would be asleep at the wheel at this moment. But clearly he's distracted by whatever's going on in the in the bowels of the volcano. Now, real quick. So there's two Florence that are uh, refer- that are seen- mentioned in this chapter. And just to just to keep them separate, Alistair Florent is the Lord of Brightwater Keep and head of House Florent. Right. He backed Renly at first, but since his death has become a huge supporter of Relor and Stannis as well, I guess. And he was with Stannis when he parlayed with Courtney Penrose at Storm's End. 
Axel Florent is the other uncle. He's the one that's been around on Dragonstone for ages. He's the yeah. Castellan of Dragonstone when Stannis isn't around. So there's Axel and there's Alistair. So just two two separate two separate uncles of Solis. Just wanted to try and keep them straight for people. I, I you know what, Michele, I'm glad you said that because I literally don't think I even noticed. <laughs> they're both a florence right I, yes I, I didn't even yeah I, I i'm not sure i even noticed that we were talking about two different people um so salah tells davos that while we were burning on the river the queen was burning traitors and that's sort of the there were two ways that this sort of like this coup of the florence over stannis could have gone one was to return him back to maybe a more conventional path you know he's dabbling with dark magic he's you know the other way was to impose their own will and their own will isn't great and unfortunately they've definitely chosen path b there because right they are burning those that they see as traitors and of course what is a traitor when you've got a king who's withdrawn and a rival faction taking power Everyone could be a traitor. It just right. depends on how you look at it. There's no yes. way to keep everybody happy with your actions. Anyone who disagrees or questions them suddenly right. becomes a traitor. Exactly. Or, you know, and they could have it both ways. If they say, if the person says, I'm just agreeing with the king, they can burn them as a traitor for not doing what they want. If you agree with them, you can say, well, you, you're doing what the king didn't want. You know, so it's, right. a, it's a bad situation. It is. Now, so he mentions Davos, Davos, thinks to himself, I knew it. I knew you were going to say that before you even said it. They burnt Lord Sunglass and Hubbard Rampton's sons. Now, so Lord Gunther Sunglass is, he, he was known to be pious. We learned that in the um, Clash of Kings prologue. And after they burned the statues of the seven, he went to Stannis and said he couldn't support Stannis any longer because they went into the sept, took the statues out and burnt them. And uh, he was thrown in the dungeon for that. And then uh, Hubbard Rampton, he's a knight who, along with his three sons, tried to defend the Sept on Dragonstone from the Queen's men when they went in to try and remove those statues for to burn them. And uh, Rampton and one of his sons were killed, and the other two were imprisoned in a dungeon. And then Septon Bear was also arrested at that time. He's the Septon on Dragonstone. We don't know if he was burned alongside these other ones, but that's... That's who Davos is talking about was burned as traitors. Yeah. And I mean, we're just talking about humans being burnt as if it's nothing, but just occasionally I let my mind wander to the atrocity that that is. And it oh, is God. awful. It's absolutely oh, yes. awful. Absolutely. And, and I mean, and it's also, you've got that sort of 1984 thing hanging over this because I mean, like just everybody on Dragonstone is just going to be terrified of what awaits them if they do something wrong and not knowing how not to do something wrong. Exactly, right. It, it's very unclear. Unless you walk around praising R'hllor on a 24-7 yeah. basis, you run a chance of doing something you didn't even know was violating the rules. Yeah, and then you get into the, into the sort of the, the witchcraft kind of thing of the only way to get your own innocence is to bring somebody else down, you know, sort of so you, you, you start pointing the finger. And oh, now, true, yeah. It's bad. Although it does seem Sala kind of indicates that he doesn't believe Stannis has knowledge of these kind of atrocities that are being done in his name. And it reminded me a little bit of the Rob Stark, Roose Bolton thing, where in that in both situations, a subordinate is making decisions and taking actions that the king might not approve of because the king is somewhere else and trusting this subordinate to to handle things in his name. So we don't know. I mean, we don't know whether Stannis is aware of these things or not, but the way that Sala explains it, it sounds like it's possible he doesn't know. Yeah. Because he won't even, I don't, I don't think we mentioned this specifically in the summary, but Stannis won't even meet with his wife and daughter. Yeah. It just smells on basically. And yeah. Right. Presumably pe- people who bring them sandwiches to toast over the volcano. <laughs> I think he mentions that food is brought and left uneaten. So right, okay. not, not even what doing that. Yeah. <laughs> but yes, if if he's not meeting with Solis, he's certainly also not meeting with Alistair Florent. So he probably doesn't know that these things are happening in his own tiny yeah. little kingdom that's now one island. 
but it but there is a sentence that makes you think Melisandre is aware because she yes she's said to sing when the fires were lit for these traitors or as she calls them servants of the dark she she categorizes and you know i mean this is this is absolutely from the textbook of tyrants she categorizes everybody as being part of them or against them kind of thing and then it yes. justifies whatever you want right um, and so if if she at least seems to be aware stannis we don't we have no idea how withdrawn he is but He's doing nothing to stop it, that's for sure. Yep. Yeah, so Davos, again, he said that she, the, the fire was sent to consumers by Melisande. So he's actually blaming Melisande for the wildfire on the Blackwater, but it was really Tyrion and Cersei. And <laughs> <laughs> Helene the pyromancer <laughs> and all his other pyromancer people. <laughs> yeah, you... You wonder at this point if her involvement, because Sala says you're not the first to be saying this, so yeah. they must be saying it very quietly, <laughs> right? <laughs> or, <laughs> you're also not the first to go to be in line to get burned, right? Yes. So you wonder if maybe Melisandre's involvement in burning the traitors, co- traitors in quotations, could be rumor, or legend, you know. Things seem to just be a little bit out of control right now, and we don't know who's doing what. Yeah, true, true. Stannis seems more and more to be coming around to the religion. We we, we heard before that Queen Solis was the more pious to this new religion. Right. Stannis. But if he's spending his whole time in the, in the volcano with uh, Melisandre, it can't just be for the warmth. I mean... <laughs> It could be for Melisandre. We we believe she's very pretty, but uh, the it feels like he's definitely coming more and more round to it. At least she's showing him things that are making him believe more and more. Yeah, certainly seems like it. We went from in the prologue, him basically telling Cresson he doesn't believe in any of this right, lore right. stuff, to using her. He told Davos in the first Davos chapter of A Clash of Kings that. He was basically just using her to induce fear from others, not others with a capital O, but other people. And then she, you know, her roles in Renly's death and Courtney Penrose's death clearly would show that he's becoming more of a believer in her ability to handle these things to now him spending days in a volcano studying flames with her, forsaking the his rule. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I think also when you when you send a shadow demon to kill your brother, you've really committed at that point. Even if you don't necessarily believe in the religion, you've there's no way back. Right. Yes, that's a good point. Yes, that that your pot committed at that point right there. Right. Right. <laughs> but Davos, I mean, Davos is hell bent on killing her. He's convinced it's a divine task. He, he mentions that the ship that came and rescued him was blown so far south off its normal path that that's the only reason he was saved, and that was clearly because he has a mission. We'll be right back. This episode is sponsored by Audible. To get a free audiobook, or two if you're an Amazon Prime member, go to our exclusive URL, audibletrial.com slash ghostsharenhall. You can find the link in our show notes. Yeah, and you know, uh, Sala mentions the fact that Davis lost his little lucky pouch of his finger bones. And I wonder if... Possibly part of the reason he feels so confident that his good fortune in being rescued is divine intervention is because he lost his lucky finger bones. And so he doesn't have that to to put on the good you know, the good fortune that he was rescued. So he right. believes it's divine intervention instead, which also suits his cause better because right. he really wants revenge yeah. for the death of his sons and he has nowhere to directed at so he's directing it entirely at melisandre so saying that it's divine that he was brought back to life to kill her really helps him with that rationalize that anyway and and the other aspect of his zealotry that's going to backfire is that he he's convinced that he's on this divine mission and that he's been rescued for this divine mission so he poo-poos any attempts to get him to rest and recover from the 
diseases that he's picked up on this. And so he's going to try and take her on in a state which will probably see him weaker than Crescent was when <laughs> Crescent <laughs> attempted and failed, you know? So Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> yeah, he's got very little chance of success here. I mean, he and he knows it. He thinks he saw that Melisandre didn't die when both she and Crescent drank the poison and Crescent died and she didn't. Of course, Crescent was also very old, so, you know, may have just been a constitution thing. Right. It was actually a very weak poison. Yes. <laughs> she was like, there's something a little tangy on my tongue. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but like you mentioned, Sala points out that he's going to die regardless of success or failure as long if he tries... He's going to die one way or the other. If he kills her, they'll burn him for revenge. If he fails, they'll burn him for trying. So it's really a, a suicide mission. And you've got to think, I mean, he is in a weakened state. If he was thinking a bit more rationally, you've got to plan a bit longer. I mean, get back into the king's good graces. You you fought and almost died on the Blackwater. You could be a hero and you could help to bring Stannis back because he trusts you and cares about you. That's true. Uh, and when if you do that, you could you could get rid of Melisandre in other ways. Yeah, this is a fool's mission he's on. And but as you're saying that, I was just thinking maybe the reason he's rushing to do it so fast is because he's afraid if he sees Devon, he will lose his courage and his drive to do it because he will he will default to being a father first and foremost and not sacrifice his life. To kill Melisandre. It's a good point, but I mean, you could try to use rational argument over assassination. True. Yes, you certainly it could. Might work. He also might feel a little bit of guilt of the fact that he was, you know, he was involved in Courtney Penrose's death, you know. And again, he he feels that he clearly feels some guilt about what he did. Blames Melisandre. And absolve Stannis, as if Stannis didn't say, let's do this. Right. There's no mention of Stannis' uh, involvement in the whole thing. So so he eventually leaves uh, the the ship and, and has a little trouble getting into the castle. We didn't mention this in the summary, but the, the guard at the castle thinks he's just some loon who's pretending to be uh, Davis Seaworth because they all think Davis died on the Blackwater. But eventually he convinces them and he gets... Gets in and he's taken to this garden, Aegon's garden. And while he's waiting there, uh, Patchface and Shireen come by. And Patchface spouts what is seemingly gibberish. Now, remember, Patchface drowned. Uh, Stefan Baratheon and his wife, Kasana, they were in Essos. They found Patchface. They were bringing him back. And then the ship, uh, the ship's ship sank in um, Shipbreaker Bay outside of Storm's End. Patchface drowned, but he didn't die. But since he's come back from that, he's, um, you know, he talks a lot of nonsense. And so he sa he stops, he's running, he stops, looks at Davos and says, Fool's blood, king's blood, blood on the maiden's thigh, but chains for the guests and chains for the bridegroom, I, I, I. Now, we can't discuss this any much further because um uh, interjection please mckelly uh we can't discuss it much further. you can't discuss it much further for the reason you're about to say i can't discuss it much further because i have no idea what you're talking about <laughs> <laughs> well i'll just say that the rereaders who recall what they read more than within the past week <laughs> likely know what he's getting at <laughs> and, uh, um so you know it's it's one of the tricky parts of the spoiler-free aspect of our show, which I very strongly believe in, is that we, we can't talk about how things tie into other events in the future. So we have to wait and talk about how something was referenced or set up or predicted in the past. I tell you so, what, McKelly, when that prophecy, because it definitely has the smell of prophecy to it, I can see uh -huh, that, uh -huh. comes to pass. I want you to remind me of this day because I, oh, I really, I really have no idea what we're talking about here. I, I have a s sort of a suspicion, but I don't know. I really don't know what that's about. Well, I will say I will do that for you right now with something that he, that Patchface said before 
that is possible was prophetic. Not pathetic, but prophetic. Prophetic. Go on. Yes. We we didn't mention it at the time, mostly because I really kind of forgot. But now that we've got Patchface and Davos lamenting about Davos's role in Courtney Penrose's death, seems like a good time to mention his ramblings from the prologue of A Clash of Kings. Okay. He heard, He was heard multiple times singing the following... The shadows come to dance, my lord, dance, my lord, dance, my lord. The shadows come to stay, my lord, stay, my lord, stay, my lord. Now, one possible interpretation of the reference to the shadows is the assassinations of Melisandre, I mean, of um, Renly, Renly and, and Courtney Penrose, Penrose yeah. by Melisandre's birthed shadow assassins. So that's... That's possibly what he was getting at in the prologue there, that shadows. Uh, the, the stay, my lord, part, it's also another possibility of this, and I can't remember if we discussed it at the time in the prologue, that was a long time ago, is the others. They're often referred to as shadows as well. So, mm. But we've since seen literal, in these Davos Stannis chapters, we've seen literal shadows assassinate people. Interesting. All right, well, thanks. We get to meet Edric Storm finally. He's been a character who's been bounced around. Seems like a good and sweet kid. Uh, I mean, he initially he complained that Davos shouldn't get in his way when he's running, but when he hears Davos coughing, he's worried about him and wants to get him a maester and shows compassion and also about the uh, the cutting off of the fingers, thinks it was uh, uh, incommensurate with his crimes. So, uh, But also, there's also a sort of pride in his father, which is interesting. I, I wonder if that was instilled yes, in him yeah. at storm's end by penrose because he didn't know oh, no he did true, know his yeah. father quite well didn't he because his father used to visit him fairly regularly yeah that's, that's what he right. says here yes his father came to visit every name day and gave him a a miniature war hammer like just like his and it's it's uh, the, the other thing that's interesting to, to me about that is there's, there's this sense of robert liking this kid more than his own kids his own kids being not his own kids and all. <laughs> there might be something there that he subconsciously is like, you know, these kids are too much like my wife and I can't stand her. <laughs> you know who else they remind me of? That brother-in-law of mine. <laughs> but I like that big-eared kid down in Stone's End. He's cool. It feels like Courtney Penrose was hell-bent on guarding Edric against Stannis acquiring him. As if he expected that Stannis might do the boy harm in some way, but I mean, we only see him for a few minutes here, but he seems do, pretty do, safe. Do we and know happy. Edric so. Storm's route to Dragonstone? Was he at the battle and was one of the ones shipped away, or was he sent to Dragonstone to hang out with Melisandre while the battle raged? I believe as the latter. Well, that's interesting because one of the things we we theorized was that he was going to be paraded in King's Landing as an example of what a Baratheon child should look like. But that clearly was not part of the plan. Yes. Or or at least not the initial plan. At least plan. not the it initial been, plan. Yeah, they could have done it later, that's true. Yeah. But So one of the last things Davos thinks before Axel Florent and his men show up is that Edric is like Robert, but also like Renly, which made him nervous. And I... Spent a lot of time this week thinking exactly why did it make him nervous? Is it fear that he's likable and personable in a way that Stannis isn't, and fear Stannis will recognize that and consider him a threat? Possibly. Possibly. Or, you know, if Edric is like Renly and grows up to be ambitious, that he might claim things himself. Right. You know, sort of. Yes, yeah, so kind of the opposite of what I'm I'm saying. But yeah, I th I I think it's I think it's the sense that this could cause danger in the future for the Stannis for the Baratheon claims to the throne that it might murky the waters. It's something along those lines is why it makes. But, but also, nervous. there's just the general yeah. Renly was just a little impetuous and maybe misused his power a little bit in some ways. I mean, that's kind of harsh. But he never had a claim to the throne, and he brought an army together to push a false claim. But that's everybody else's fault. That's right. everybody else's fault. <laughs> they should have all said right. no. You know, 
Elena Tyrell exactly. was on board with that plan. <laughs> Just say no. He has no claim. Me and Elena Tyrell, the voices of reason in Westeros. Right. So Axel <laughs> Florent, not Alistair Florent, arrives exactly. and takes <laughs> Davos to the du- you know sends Davos to the dungeons because he meant to use his knife on Our Lady. How could they have known that? Right. As I, I as I see, there's three possible options. Okay. One being that. Salador San alerted them to protect Davos from actually making an attempt, figuring it's better if he at least doesn't actually try and gets put in a dungeon and maybe um, cools off a bit. Seems unlikely, though, because he would have had to have had a man sent right behind Davos to get a message delivered in time and then, you know, in time to uh, to do anything useful here. Yeah, yeah. Plus, it's extremely dangerous. <laughs> right. Because <laughs> we know what happens to traitors. <laughs> right, yes. You're sending your, your friend to a dungeon from which he's unlikely to return. Yeah. Right. And, uh, and and possibly bringing the eye of Sauron down on you as well. Yes. <laughs> Why didn't you stop him? <laughs> <laughs> yes, so th- that doesn't seem like the leading option. So uh, I'm stealing your, your theories here, but a queen spy overheard Davos talking. It, he was talking on a Lysidi ship, so there shouldn't be too many Florence or, you know, uh, Relo loyalists there. But not impossible. I mean, like I said, I, I, I thought I, I was pretty convinced that whatever he said on the ships was going to get back. So, yeah, this is definitely definitely a possibility. And then the third option is, is that Melisandre saw it coming in the flames and sent Axel to intervene. I have a fourth option, which is simply that he was carrying a knife and they've decided that that's what he was going to do and they're just dragging him off to the dungeon. It's become that type of place where exactly. everyone is expect- exactly. is, is considered exactly. doing something. Do we know for a fact that Axel Florent was referring to Melisandre? Does he follow that up? He only says Our Lady. So he could so have, he could been, have been thinking been Solis. About Solis, exactly. Yeah. So th- that's the other thing you see. I-, I think it's maybe just a matter of this is an unfamiliar face in Dragonstone. He's going to the dungeon, you know. Sure. Which which is possibly the best news for Davos, that one, because there's a chance he'll get out, you know. Right. Once once news reaches Stannis that Davos is back, he might say, I want to see him, you know. Yes, that's true. That's true. We can but hope. Do you have some background for us? I do indeed. So, Salador San is a Lysine pirate, as is Corain Sathmantes the captain of Shayala's Dance, the ship that rescued Davos. In fact, it was Davos who sailed to Lys to recruit San to Stannis' cause in the first place. And Salador San's flagship of his fleet of striped galleys is called Valerian. So, why does a man from Lys have a ship named after the famed and now dead capital city of the Valerian Freehold? Well, the short answer might be that Lice was originally a colony of the Valerian Freehold. In fact, because of the island of Lice's desirable climate, it became a posh vacation destination for the dragon lords of Valeria. Lice is known to have ample sunshine, is fertile, dotted with fruit trees and palm trees, and surrounded by beautiful waters filled with sea life, hence the name, the nickname anyway, Lice the Lovely. Now, one other thing I wanted to mention about Lice or Lys, I'm never sure which way it's it's actually pronounced. I, I go back and forth, kind of. Is You'll see two different spellings in the text of uh, the Song of Ice and Fire books. There's L-Y-S-E-N-I, which in my mind is Lyseni, yep. and L-Y-S-E-N-E, which in my mind is Lysene. Yep. Lyseni tends to be used as a noun, and Lyseni, and Lysene... As an adjective. Lyseni, yeah. noun, Lysene, adjective. Yes, I, I, I can see that. Although I might put an extra syllable on the end of Lysene. I might make that Lysene. So Lyseni and Lysene. But oh. you, I think I, yours is better. Yours is a better way of doing it. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just explaining what goes on in my fevered mind. Well, thanks for that. Um, comparison, with the telev- comparison with the television show, the conversation with Salador takes place on the ship at sea in the TV show. Basically, it's as if Salador rescued him. There's no sort of intermediate uh, ship okay. there. Uh, but the conversation is not dissimilar. 
when Davos reaches Dragonstone, he is granted immediate access to Stannis and Melisande. He blames her directly to her face for the failure at the Blackwater. She blames him for, not unreasonably, convincing Stannis to leave her at home. He loses his temper and attacks her and is then dragged off to the dungeons. So, okay. Um, Either way, he ends up in the dungeon. <laughs> exactly. And, but, but certainly with, with reason here, for sure. Right. Yes, yes. Um, just while I'm talking about um, comparison with the television show, you know that I go hunting for this chapter in the TV show. It does mean I miss some of the big picture of the TV show. And I noticed while I was looking for this that I saw a whole scene where Rob Stark and Roose Bolton arrive in Harrenhal, um, which has been abandoned by uh, Tywin, Tywin Lannister. Yeah. And... They, he left behind 200 dead Northmen. Basically, they murdered everyone from the dungeons and left them all dead. And Roos and Rob arrive and they're kind of like, everyone's mad about it. And Rickard Karstark is complaining about, you know, will there be any revenge for these dead Northerners? Okay. But that's how, uh, how Hall changes hands. So Rob is actually present for that. Oh, all right. All right. Good stuff. Yeah. Pedantry Corner. Uh, I think you spotted the good one. <laughs> I'll set it up for you. <laughs> uh, when Salador meets Davos, he he fails to believe that he is... He, he refuses to believe he's real. He thinks he's a ghost. And he says, you must be. The Davos I knew was never so thin or so pale as you. And I thought... He's been uh, marooned on a rock in the in a bay for weeks. I can't imagine him being very pale. Yes, I think I think your use of the word maroon is very apt. He's <laughs> pro- <laughs> he would have been marooned. Right. He's stuck on an island for that long. Uh, yeah, and, and certainly in the TV show, he's red and blistered. His skin is peeling off. That's yeah, what I would the, expect. The, the, yeah, yes. exactly. Yeah, you're right. So news and notes, um, we are looking forward. I mean, this will have happened in the past by the time you hear this. Oh, no, this won't. Actually, this will be just about contemporary, right? I mean, this It'll be the... Be... That's right. Yes. We're we're recording it beforehand. It'll be released the next morning after. Right. So we're going to have a chat with our uh, Buy Me A Coffee sustainers after we've all watched the first episode of House of the Dragon on HBO, which is very exciting. I can't it wait. It sure is. Yes. And that's really most of the news this consuming this week is we're recording on Saturday and tomorrow on Sunday is the big uh, premiere of Dance of the Dragons which we're all very excited for yeah and I'll take I'll take this small one so you can have the big one so the small one is thanks to everyone for giving us uh, positive ratings on Spotify um, we're now in second place in the rates for uh, Song of Ice and Fire podcasts uh, mostly five star ratings so thank you everyone yep we have the we have the most of any a song of ice and fire podcast with a 5.0 rating we're second overall but the one who's in front of us does not have a 5.0 rating so uh-huh. keep up the great work we're so thankful and so appreciative beautiful and then so i i, I missed this uh, a listener named cat left a really nice review on our youtube a uh, 50th uh, episode special that we did with Molly uh, oh, God, emceeing. Yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, so the the re- the uh, comment goes like this. Hey, guys, I just found your podcast a few weeks ago, and I love it. I started, started rereading the books in English, actually, for the first time, and found your podcast on a streaming platform, along with a bunch of others with the same topic. For my ears... You two have by far the most pleasant voices, and the balance between summary, background information, jokes, and personal stories is exactly how I like it, while refreshing my English every day in traffic. Thank you very much, and nice to put faces with the voices now. Uh, of course, she would have seen us for the first time in that YouTube video, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Well, thank you, Kat, that's awesome. Um, and that can was. I just say one more time, to everyone who is not born in a family where you learn English as a first language, that I am in awe of your ability to learn a second language because I would love to be able to speak a second language. Oh, me I too. Can't. Oh, yes. I cannot. I can't imagine trying to read a book in a second language. Oh, I know. And listening to us jibber jabber as, as we do, <laughs> so unprofessionally so, 
Yes. All right, let's conclude. So uh, Davos' obsession with Melisandre is affecting how he sees her. Um, his point of view is definitely uh, askew. And like you said at the very beginning, after the summary, is or or, or our feelings of on Melisandre being manipulated by Davos's point of view. Well, that she's he he's got us possibly thinking she is a monster. But maybe if we had her point of view, we would see that she's doing things for a very rational, logical reason, and maybe it is being misunderstood for whatever reason. Yeah, but the whole singing while the traitors are marched into the flames. Not a good look. Not that's a good not look. A good look. Now, again, we didn't see it firsthand. It was right. a secondhand report. Yes. Could be very much like Renly's ghost. Yes, that is true. Yes. She might have been like, no, you burn statues, not people, for all we know. <laughs> yeah, that was the singing. It was her shouting, no, <laughs> this is not how we do things around here. <laughs> she she defaulted back to her first language for this because she was such, <laughs> such a panic. It sounded like singing to the right. <laughs> uh, so what happens to Davos now? Precedent isn't good. People in those dungeons tend to get very hot very soon. Yes, but his relationship with Stannis might save him. What about uh, Devon as a Stannis squire? Maybe that could maybe factor one way or another, or possibly. His mental state, could he be deemed temporarily insane? Yeah. And, you know, that he was dehydrated and sick and fevered. And yeah, yeah. Maybe they'll excuse it some. I, I gotta say, if I'm Devon, I'm distancing myself. Like, <laughs> <laughs> don't blame me for that guy. Seaworth? My last name's not <laughs> Seaworth? <laughs> Let Stannis is off staring at the flames, leaving rule up to Selyse and Alistair and Melisandre. Not that there's much left to rule, really, at this point. It's basically just Dragonstone and a few other rocks in the bay. A few piles of charred bones. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, they are bur- they're, they're burning people alive, and uh, you've got to imagine that's got to be alienating some of the people who stayed. I mean, if you, if you stayed loyal to Stannis through all this, you've been pretty loyal, and to see some of you get burned for it... Yes. feel great. I mean... It could come back, well, it could come back to burn St- uh, Stannis and Alistair. Terrible way to make a pun there. Yeah, but, well, that's um, good though, yeah. <laughs> but yes, I mean, you're already got a very diminished, loyal uh, base here. Last thing you want to do is be alienating people and burning people alive. I mean, in general, you don't want to be doing that. But you're also possibly alienating the final few loyalists you have left alive. And whilst whilst they may have the biggest fleet on the seas right now, the Red Wine fleet is supposedly coming to King's Landing, and when that arrives, they they won't have any fleet on the seas because the only way to survive that will be to flee. Yes, exactly. Doesn't seem like there'd be much of a fight to put up. The, the Lannisters, t- uh, Tywin, I believe, told Tyrion that they were just waiting for the Lannister fleet to come around before they siege Dragonstone. When that happens, I mean, yeah. it, the jig is up. You yeah. you got to run or you're going to die, one or the yeah. other. I agree. Okay, so there's three ways that you could help us. You can leave us a positive review. Um, we are grateful for all of them. You can buy some merchandise at ghostsofharrenhall.threadless.com or you can buy us a cup of Arbor Gold at buymeacoffee.com slash ghostsharrenhall. Uh, become a Lord Paramount or Knight of the Realm Sustainer, and you'll keep us going for longer. And thanks to those who have already become sustainers. Absolutely. And as always, you can reach us at ghost.harrenhall at gmail.com. You can go out and follow us on Twitter at Ghost Heron Hall. We're also on Facebook, Instagram, Discord, and YouTube. Thanks for listening. Thanks. Bye. Bye.